Welcome back. This is the March 2024 layout update, and March was definitely the month of the airbrush. I spent many nights airbrushing well over 120 stencils in support of my graffiti tower project, and in this video I'm going to talk about the technique I used to switch colors on the fly. This was also the month of the road trip, and I got to take a trip to one of my favorite hobby shops to pick up my new Rapido Turbo Liner, and I'll be doing a quick review of that. And then my second road trip was to the Kitchener Model Railroad Show, where I got a few little things for the layout and one big thing for the layout. Which, the more I think about that big thing, I'm pretty sure it was probably stolen. And finally, I have a pair of locomotives I'm thinking about doing a fantasy paint scheme on, and I'd like a bit of your feedback on it. Okay, March 2024, let's get started. So earlier this month, I was able to complete the projects that I started in February, uh, namely the custom repaint job on Go Transit's worst train, the two F40PHs and the F7. And then just recently, I completed um, the two apartment towers that were based on the Oceanwide Plaza development in Los Angeles. These two projects kept me occupied for about a good solid month and a half and so now I'm considering what it is I'd like to work on next. I have a lot of building kits that I should start putting together or start kit bashing. Um, I'd really like to start looking at installing some station platforms and I really would like to get some basic scenery applied so I can camouflage a lot of this plywood. The two apartment buildings that I was working on had over 60 different graffiti pieces applied and many of those pieces were an application of two or three colors and that means that I airbrushed somewhere between like 150 to 180 individual stencils with different colors. Um, I am by no means a professional airbrusher or artist in that regard and I don't have a high quality airbrush but I thought I would share my process for how I swapped between colors um, to make this manageable because cleaning an airbrush and reloading paint can take forever. So as I was working through um, my two graffiti towers, I was getting increasingly frustrated at the amount of time it took to switch between colors in an airbrush. So I came up with a technique that works well for me. There are professional airbrush people out there and there's very experienced hobbyists that likely know how to do a better job of this than I do. I'm just showing what worked for me. I have an average airbrush, I have very average paint, and I just want to show how I was able to switch between colors so that I was able to maintain my sanity while I was throwing on 120 different stencil colors. So I'm just going to get a basic stencil in place. This was one of the stencils I used on the project. And I think I'm going to start with pink. So. I have a clean pipette. I'm gonna load up a little bit of pink. Make sure that's working. Lay down my pink color. Now, I'm gonna go back in with the same pipette. I'm gonna draw out the excess paint. I'm gonna get a bit of water and I'm gonna agitate it inside the cup three or four times and shoot that into a waste cup. Take a clean paper towel or a dirty paper towel, clean up the cup, shoot through till the color's gone, grab another pipette for the next color, and there we go, new, new colors loaded. And I can just add that in. Now I went a little too heavy on the blue, so I'm gonna reverse the process. Draw out any of the remainder. Agitate the cup. Clear out the paint. Clean out the cup, make sure it's good and clear. Add back in some pink. And there we go. I've added the second color and the stencil's done. 
One of the highlights of March was taking a road trip to Otter Valley Railroad. I believe Otter Valley is one of the largest model railroad retailers in southwestern Ontario and it's about an hour southwest of me. I usually visit the hobby shop a few times a year and I always try to make an effort uh, to attend the manufacturer's open house. This time I went down to pick up a few basic supplies that I'd had on my list for a while. I picked up some fine ballast cinders so I can start filling in the yard. Um, I got two packages of some microtrain couplers because I need to replace the factory couplers on a few of my Cato engines. I got another small bottle of super glue accelerant and uh, the folks there were generous enough to give me an old poster for my collection. But ultimately I was there to pick up my pre-order of Rapido's Amtrak RTL Turbo Liner. So for anyone who is not familiar with the Turbo Liner, um, it was a high-speed train developed for Amtrak in the United States between the 70s and the 80s. It was unique because it had an innovative gas turbine electric powertrain and was designed for high-speed service. It uh, obviously has a distinctive appearance with its streamlined design. However, despite all that good technology and promising performance, it faced a lot of challenges. Um, it had high operating costs and apparently a lot of maintenance issues. Uh, it was eventually phased out of service by Amtrak and completely discontinued. It was a really interesting experiment in high-speed rail technology but it didn't achieve the long-term success that I think a lot of the people had hoped for. I'm not sure if the Turboliner ever traveled north of the border into Canada, but for my Proto-inspired railroad, I'm going to assume that it took the place of the Maple Leaf and traveled between New York and Toronto, um, carrying passengers across the border. I was really excited to get the Turboliner, um, as I think it's a really great example of a failed futuristic design. Um, train sets don't seem to do well in North America, as opposed to, let's say, China or Japan. So having this experimental relic on my railroad felt appropriate as I you know, continually lean into that dystopian aesthetic. My first impression of the Turboliner is this is an outstanding model. I um, opted for the DC version to save some money, so I can't speak to its DCC operations or its sound but I can tell you this is easily the smoothest running and responsive train set I have ever purchased, um, especially from Rapido. The details are beautiful and the paint is really crisply applied. Both the leading and tailing units of the train are powered and the coach and cafe cars roll very smoothly. This is probably some of the most freewheeling cars I've ever purchased. The coupling system is unique as it resembles a hairpin that grabs a receiving pin on the opposite car. Um, I was hesitant to apply too much force when attaching the cars, so I had to experiment with some different approaches to couple them um, because I didn't want to break anything. The forward and reverse lights work beautifully and the interior lights do not flicker. The unique coupling system between the cars keeps them very close together, um, but they still effortlessly navigate my 10 inch radius curves. It was a treat to unbox a new train, put it on the track, and run it without any issues. I let it weave itself back and forth um, across the layout for over an hour as I broke in the motors and it never derailed once. I got to enjoy a second road trip in the month and I headed over to Kitchener to Bingham's to attend the Kitchener Model Railroad Show. I had an opportunity to help a friend working on some promotional activities for the show so I was able to get early access to the show and meet some of the vendors before the doors opened. I generally have mixed feelings about a lot of the train shows I've been to lately as I really rarely come across cars or rolling stock that interest me. So I have just resigned myself to setting my sights on other types of items. Um, that said, I was really happy to find a Cato F40PH with updated couplers 
and the gentleman selling it was great and sold it to me for an unbelievably fair price. And I met another vendor who was selling a whole host of you know train souvenirs and I was excited to find a vendor who had a whole bunch of Via Rail LRC buttons. And for me, the best piece that I found at that show from the same vendor was an aluminum passenger platform sign. Um, everything was very fairly priced and I love having the sign in my train room. I was also lucky enough to run into Dave Scott of Scott's Rails. I immediately recognized him with his big yellow bag as he made his way around the show. Dave is an entertaining guy who has his YouTube channel called Scott Rails. Um, he's pretty unbelievable uh, as he releases many videos a week and he has live streamed as long as nine hours. At the close of the show, my friend was kind enough to give me some boxcars for a strange little project that I'm considering. Um, it's passenger train related, but probably in one of the most unique ways possible. Um, also, he generously gave me a custom painted Cato F40PH with Via Rail colors. This means that I now have two F40PHs and I want to repaint them. The Cato unit I bought runs perfectly. The unit that my friend gave me uh, is incomplete. It's missing its window glazing, the horns are broken or have fallen off, and it's currently chipped for DCC. So I would like to know, um, would people be interested in me sourcing out some parts to complete the models, and then applying a fantasy paint scheme? Perhaps something inspired by the Ontario Northland Railway? The ONT is another railroad that I think should make an appearance on my layout and because the rolling stock and engines are so hard to come by, uh, custom painted cars might be the perfect addition. Yeah, the more I think about it, that sign is probably stolen. I am really looking forward to April because I think I'm gonna settle down into building some structures and opening up some kits, and that's gonna be a nice change of pace from some of the other things I've been working on. Uh, as always, I appreciate you tuning in, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you.